Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast. I am Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello, I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Today I'm talking with Aviva Woman winner of Teen Tour Theater. Now Aviva is one of our oldest customers. She's been using Theater Folk Plays for close to 10 years. And uh, she started Teen Tour Theater because she wanted to think of a way to really push and challenge her acting students. And one of those ways was providing an opportunity to get her kids to perform for audiences other than loved ones, which I think is a pretty unique thing for teens and preteens to do. So if you are a teacher and you are doing doing a touring show currently with your students, or you're thinking about touring a show, take a seat, have a listen. There's lots of great information here, including the top three things a teacher needs to think about when doing a tour. So let's get to the interview. Hello, everybody. I am here today. I'm very happy to be talking to a longtime Theatre Folk customer, Aviva Wallman winner Hello, Aviva. Hi. How are I'm you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm looking out my window at some more snow. I'm sure you have lots of snow where you are in Montreal. Like and uh, Aviva, you run Teen Tour Theatre, yeah? So we know you because you're very generous with uh of uh, we seem to how many years have you been using theater folk oh, plays? It's it's been a while. Maybe like eight or nine. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know. It's like it's just been one of those things that every year we see that that order come through for you and for Teen Tour. So let's start off with what that is. What is Teen Tour Theater? Uh, Teen Tour Theater is a theater school slash tour group that I started 11 years ago. I began it because I was teaching at another local school here. I had been teaching for 10 years at another school in Montreal and was trying to think of a way to challenge some of my students who were who had been with me forever. I had kids who were in their late teens and had started with me when they were nine and 10 and even younger. And I wanted to think of a way to push them further, especially the ones who wanted to take acting much further. And so I created two concepts at this other theater school. One was touring so that they were performing for people other than their loved ones, which was a very different experience. And trying to create a workshop program for kids who wanted to take it further than just doing theater for the obvious reasons that we think theater is phenomenal, like self-confidence and learning how to handle yourself in a any kind of interview situation and learning how to speak in front of people and all of those other things. This was for the kids who were really, really focused on taking theater to the next level in their life. And so I did that for a year there. I was really happy with how it went and then decided to launch it as a program that was unique to everything else. And that's how it became a teen tour. So basically the concept of the school is that the older students, and when I first began, we had only teenagers and I only had two classes. And basically those groups, we had our junior tour group and our senior tour group, which are the ones you've heard of because those are the ones mostly that I've used the plays for. Last year I used school days in my younger group, which is not a tour show. That's just younger group uh, doing training. I started that the first year, only the seniors toured. I think I had eight or, or 10 students in the class. The tour basically is a show that the kids work on. Now we do high schools as well. Then it was just elementary school material that they rehearse this show. The seniors are the most advanced group in the school. So they've already gone through all the lessons that we've that I've given them from the beginning. And most of them had started with me when they were quite young at that point. And so this was just just a show. And we went into the rehearsal process. And sometimes I would bring in other professionals from the industry here in Montreal to work with them on different things, puppetry, uh, movement, uh, mime, whatever we were using in the show that year. And then we went out and we performed at local libraries, elementary schools, even the Saturday morning program for children that runs in the lobby of one of our theaters here in Montreal, which is the Centaur. 
And so it began from there and then grew. Then we had the junior tour group, which does less performances and has the first part of the year. They don't touch their play. It's all about learning the skills until January. And then as the years went on, I started getting phone calls from people asking if I would do classes for younger children. And that grew. So now we have classes for seven-year-olds right up to young 20-something. And we have our workshop program, which I started as well that first year which we started with one workshop a year, and now we are up to oh, roughly seven or eight for the 14 to 30-year-old group. And usually we do four for the eight to uh, 13-year-old group. And that, those are co-taught by me or not even taught by me, although I'm always there. We bring in professionals from the field in Montreal. So, for example, we just had, we just finished one with Simon Peacock, who is a director for voice for video games, which is a huge industry here. Oh, wow. And so we just went to uh, Harmony Studios and Simon came in and worked with 12 of my students ranging in age from 14 to 27 on how to work in the studio on voice for video games. Uh, a month before that, we had one with Terrence Gamble, who does voice for animation, and we went into the studios and did dubbing and taught them how to use the Rhythmo band. So we go really far with the ones who are interested in that. But that's not the only focus of the school. The school really is about learning those skills, voice, movement, comportment, uh, how to approach a scene, how to approach character, how to approach monologues, things like that. That was a mouthful I just gave. Ah, that's okay. So let's talk about the teens and the touring aspect. Why do you think it's important to have teens perform before, you know, for people who maybe aren't their loved ones and to have this process of taking a show on the road? There's a few reasons. First and foremost, it's an amazing thing to perform for your family and your friends because they love you. But it's an even better thing sometimes that those parents, the family and friends still come. They sit at the back. But it's an amazing thing to be able to perform for and basically control, you know, get a reaction from your audience of people that don't know you. So they're not coming in and they don't automatically think you're wonderful because they love you. They actually think you're wonderful because of what you're the story that you're telling them on stage. And that's the primary reason why I started with the tour. How many shows do uh, the teens usually do? It depends on the group. It depends on the year. This coming year, we're not doing as many because I have a very, very busy group of seniors. Um, most of the students who workshops go right up into the 20s. But for the most part, the junior tour and the senior tour, they range in age from about 13 years old to 22. So most of them are either in high school, uh, CEGEP, which you don't have in Ontario, which is kind of a college, two-year college program before you go to university that's mandatory here, or university itself. And so those students are super busy. They have crazy schedules. So some years we manage to do it and we can get as many as 10 shows. doesn't happen very often. Usually we go somewhere between four and seven. This year we're doing four, possibly five for the seniors. And the juniors have just started arranging their schedule. So I don't know how many they're going to do. But we do have years. A couple of years ago, we had a student who had studied with me from a young age. And he just graduated from university in playwriting. And he wrote a wonderful show called Exposure. And that one, we actually did as many as we could. It was for high school audiences. And the kids were so determined. They had helped him to through the process of writing the piece. And so because of that, they really wanted to get out there. So we went to as many high schools as we could. I think in the end, we did seven. But of course, they're wow. always missing school. So it's kind of hard to... You, the norm is four or five. <laughs> Is there any different skills that you teach these teens specific to touring that you maybe wouldn't do in the because you, like well, what? One, especially with shows for young audiences, we try to make the shows interactive if we possibly can. So that means that very often they're controlling the audience. They're getting the audience to participate in the show. Obviously, that's not something we do when we, we've we done uh, shows that you've done. Most of the shows we've chosen from you are high school audiences, which are a little bit different. We don't have them as interactive. But one of the skills that they do when they work on a show that is aimed at young audiences is to ask the audience to participate, ask them questions, to control them, to be able to get them in and out of the story is an amazing skill. At the same time, it's also a touring show, so they have to change the way they stage the show each and every time, depending on the school or library or theater that they're in, because no two stages look exactly the same. In fact, sometimes we'll go to locations that don't even have a stage, and they'll have to adapt the show 
to be able to work so that the audience can see everybody all the time and that they don't miss out on anything. Those are some pretty amazing, just like well, I know that well rounding skills, you know, like how do you adapt to a situation? How do you think on your feet to take your product and still make it the best that it can be regardless of where you are and what's happening around you? Exactly. And I mean, even if you want to really go into skills, it also teaches you how to behave, never mind all the acting and theater stuff. But, you know, there's a certain, we have a big discussion before we go in about how you behave in the halls of a school, how you talk to the teachers and the students that pass you when you're going off, you're leaving the stage area to go to the washroom while you're setting up. Because we arrive at every venue about an hour or two before we perform so that they can walk through the space and, you know, make the changes that they need to change and and be prepared because these still are kids. It's great to watch them come in as a group really quietly and respectfully and greet the principal or the secretary or whoever is, you know, walking us into the building. It's it's quite an interesting uh, thing. I really, really enjoy what I do. And it's really fun to watch them all grow. And we have so many students that are working professionally now and that, you know, not not all. Some of them are have gone off and are studying pre-med now, which is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Hopefully they're using that skills in that way. Those students stay in touch less often than the ones who are still really in this. We, we have, I have two students who started with me when I just, just opened Team Tour, but had also been with me at that other theater school when they were very, very young. One of them just came back from being at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York for a year, and another one just graduated with his master's from the University of Ohio, and they both are studying Meisner technique, and um, they've now come back and run workshops for my younger students. So it's amazing the skills of these kids and the excitement that they have about what we do. And then they come back to share it with the school later, what they've learned from other people who, you know, are know things that I don't know. It's it's really, really a great, a great thing. And the kids keep in touch with each other over the years. And it's really nice. When did you know that not just being involved with theater, but theater, but teaching theater was something that really you really connected with and wanted to pursue? Well, I wanted to teach before I wanted to be involved in theater. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Younger. How come? I loved working with kids. And I started babysitting when I was like 11. <laughs> and uh, I really, that was something that always drew me. Theater was a hobby. And then when it came time to go to university, I actually decided I had been acting a bit. And I decided that perhaps that was what I wanted to do. So I went into, as a drama major. But once I was in university and doing shows, I realized pretty quickly, quickly that I really loved directing and that was probably the part I liked the best. I was still teaching. I was teaching part-time theater classes at local places, you know, community centers and things like that in the city. And I loved that and started honing, taking more directing classes, started taking drama and education classes kind of to the side of my program in school. And then when I was just about, I had just, just graduated, I was teaching at a, another local theater school, which to be honest with you, I can't even remember the name because it's probably almost 30 years ago. Yeah, for the life of me, I'm pulling a blank on the name, but I don't even think it exists anymore. And I was teaching there and I had auditioned for Jordy Productions was doing uh, their a tour version of The Wizard of Oz. And I got cast as Linda the Good Witch. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, uh, I would have had, and it was a tour show and I would have had to give up my teaching job to leave and to go tour for three months as well. I was about three months into dating the person I have now been married to for 26 years. And I just sat down and kind of said to myself, is that really what I want? Do I want to leave? Do I want to leave my boyfriend at the time do I want to leave my teaching job to go and do this tour and it was a bit of a conversation in my head but eventually I realized that I really didn't like standing up in front of an audience all that much Um, Uh the applause made me very uncomfortable it was never my favorite part of the whole process and I really didn't want to leave I knew I was I mean a year and a half later I was already considering getting married I was in my mid-20s I knew I wanted to have kids I didn't think that vagabondy kind of life was going to be for me. And so that's when I decided I was really going to focus 
on teaching. It's interesting when we hit, when we hit those points, right? Yeah. Where it's like, okay, it really, it's such a cliche, but it really is. It's here we go, two woods, two roads. Yeah. <laughs> Which one are we going to go down? Yeah, it really, um, really is. And it, it, it's a vivid memory for me. And actually, the daughter of the woman who cast me in that show, her name is Alison Darcy, and she is an amazing, I don't know if you've ever come to Montreal, but she's the, um, one of the heads of Scapegoat Carnival, which is a production company here in Montreal that does a lot of classic theater. They just did Othello at one of our larger theaters. They did Medea last year. They did the Bacay. And she is an amazing, amazing actress, director, producer. And she does workshops for me sometimes here. And her mother is Elsa Bolam, who many, many years ago oh, yeah. ran. Okay, so Elsa is the person who cast me in that show. And Allison is the daughter of Morris Padbury, who started the Centaur Theater, and Elsa Bolin, who started Geordie Theater. And Allison was ill one night when she was supposed to teach a workshop, and her mom came in and replaced her. And it was really funny to say, do you know that you are, you were my crossroads? <laughs> she said, this is amazing. You know, well, how far you've come, all the things you've done. It's great what you're doing with the kids. And I said, you know, it was like, it was kind of because of you that I took that, that I took that path. So it's very funny how it all comes full circle. Yeah, it always does. It always does. Why do you think, why is it important that youth and teens participate in theater, regardless of whether they're going to go off and have a great theater life or they're going to go do pre-med? Like, why Why is it important? The skills that you can get from having to, one, get up in front of other people, but also, and more importantly, the prep that you do before you get up in front of other people. It's, you know, we call it, it's like a team sport. You really have to be able to work with others. There's so many components to putting a piece on. And it's, it's so great for kids to come out of themselves, whether they take a leadership role or a sideline role. And I, I don't mean a role on stage. I mean a role in the process to go through the process together with other people and figuring out what works for you and what what doesn't. On a personal thing, you know, I've been teaching for a lot of years. I have two kids. I have a 23-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son. My 23-year-old daughter started with me at the theater school when she was five years old, when I was teaching at another theater school. And she has now graduated from university. She's a professional actor. This is her passion. We always knew it was her passion. I have an 18-year-old son who's really into computers. And when he was little, he's about to apply to university this year, actually. And, and when he was little, you know, every year I would say, just take one class. It's, it's so good for you. You know, he's kind of a quiet guy. And I said, you know, it'd be good. Bring you out of yourself. No, no interest, no interest, no interest. And then he ended up the, the high school that both my kids went to, which is a great school. One of the requirements, a very small school, and one of the requirements is that in grade seven and eight, you must take music music, drama, and art, as well as all your science stuff, and as well as being part of your robotic club or your sports clubs or whatever. You oh, if only that was the way everywhere, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm. The, the small <laughs> private school, the great school, and they really want to expose the kids to everything. And so he had to take it for two years. And I was so glad because even though he had never been interested, I knew that this was going to be a great life experience for him. And, and it really was because I remember his drama teacher coming to me and saying, you know, he really takes a leadership role. I mean, with my mouth hanging open, pulling my quiet, who wanted nothing to do with theater. Yeah, he doesn't actually want to be on the stage. But, you know, he's taking charge. And he ended up, as the years went through, he and his, his closest friend at school, they ended up being like the theater tech guys. They won the theater tech award when they graduated. You know, they helped build the sets and learned how to do the lights and learned how to be backstage. And, you know, all of those skills, whether you're backstage, on stage, working lights or, or hammering a set or doing something, you are part of this unit. And the really nice thing about theater, because sports are phenomenal and they're a great way to become part of the unit and to learn together and to learn to work with other people. But in theater, it's pretty non-competitive at that level. You know, of course, there's a competitive aspect to theater because people are, who are auditioning and want the bigger, the big part or whatever, which, you know, we talk a lot in the school about how it's not, a, I'm sure you've heard it before, said by other teachers, not the size of the part, it's what you do with it um, yeah. uh, that that makes it. And sometimes the the biggest part is not the most exciting part, nor the most challenging part. But when you're a part of all of this, you learn so much about working with other people, about respecting other people's skills, about respecting the audience, about respecting the person who's pinning your, your costume. 
all of those things teach us about working with other people outside of ourselves and that everybody is relevant to the process. And I think that's the most valuable lesson that theater can teach to anybody, no matter where you end up in the process. It's that process of working with other people to accomplish a goal. And then, you know, theater is the greatest thing because when it's all over, you get applause. And perhaps <laughs> I don't love that part of it, but, <laughs> but you know, some do. Oh, yes. And and I would say probably 99.999% of the students that I've taught over the years really do. They love that in the end, someone's kind of patting you on the back by, by clapping. And it's, well, it's an acknowledgement of you've done a good job. Exactly. You know, and that's all anyone really wants, isn't it? They just want to know they've done something good. Exactly. And one of the things that's so amazing about taking the kids on tour is not only do they get applause, but then they get kids, especially when we work with younger audiences, you know, kids coming up. And when we end our shows, whether it's high school or elementary audiences, the kids stand up on stage, they introduce themselves, they say their age and their high school. And, you know, then the kids in the audience get to ask them questions. It's part of our process. And, you know, in the high schools, it's cool because they get that kind of admiring feeling from people who are their peers or for the ones who are a little bit older, almost their peers. But with the little kids, they come up, they high five them, they hug them, they ask them to walk them back to their class. It's, it's really, really, really cool. <laughs> That's probably the best part for me is when the whole show is over and all these little kids kind of, we say, okay, and you know, our actors love hugs and they love high fives and the kids, you know, they look at their teachers and we get permission from the teachers and they just basically bomb the stage. And it's, it's really, really cute. They just come rushing and I think it's great because it's it's the best thing it ever. Is. Actually, <laughs> at the same time, I'm going to throw something else in that you made me think of. One of the greatest things I find, and I think that the kids even comment on, is that it's a place, at least my theater school, is a place for the kids to come in and leave all the garbage that happens in high school, especially behind and all the stress of the day and all the stress about exams or fighting with a teacher or fighting with a friend or all of those things, they come in and for a few hours, we just have fun and we go at it and we hang out and we, you know, we're, we're working on stuff, but it's, they're laughing a lot. They're being silly a lot. And, you know, it's still extracurricular. And for me, except maybe senior tour where we're much, much more focused because they've already gone through that whole process for years with the school. They're really coming in and we spend three hours and we just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. We have a great time and that's why they're there. But those are the kids who are the most passionate about this. And, you know, they're there because they want to do this show and be a part of it. But for the younger groups, it's so nice to have them come in and smile and have parents afterwards come out and go, you know, this is what they look forward to all week. This is what they talk about all week, being able to come in and work and see their friends in the theater school. And like I said, you know, there I'll never forget there's a, a young woman who graduated from NYU and drama and education who had been with me for years. And she's actually living in your city now in Toronto. She's finishing her master's in dramaturgy at one of the universities there. And she started a Facebook group years ago for past students. That was one of the greatest things I ever heard in my life, that they have this little teen tour Facebook. I'm not on it. I have nothing to do with it. But that this group of kids who had known each other for so many years, and now they're in their mid to late 20s, wanted to keep in touch. And that was how they did it because of this feeling of coming in and just feeling like it's a safe place. And I think very often the theater is a really safe place. Well, what a great thing that if like if a student is not having a good time at their school, yeah. that there's a place where they can go and actually just be themselves and not have to worry about all that extra, well, baggage, like exactly. you said. And how would a, you know, it just it's a testament to the community that's being created, you know, where if they if they want to keep in touch, that means that they've made a connection. Yeah, exactly. Which, what better thing can you teach a, can you teach a student than to find a community and maintain a community? Exactly. It's great. That's they come back. I mean, like I said, the senior workshop program, which is that added program is for students who are um, 14 right up to whatever the eldest we've ever had is someone who was 30 which was kind of funny I was we were joking around we needed to change the name of school but 
because it's called Teen Tour Theater. But, you know, it's really nice because every time we have one of these workshops, people come in who haven't seen each other in months or sometimes even years if they're coming back to the city and they're just signing up for this one workshop. And they're all so good to each other and they're all so happy to see each other, even if there's a 10-year age difference between them. And that's amazing, you know. Okay, so as we end up here, so we have a lot of a lot of teachers who listen and who maybe have thought about including a, some kind of tour as part of their program. So what would you say would be the top three things that a teacher needs to think about if they're going to take a class and, and do a tour? First and foremost is a commitment from your students. If you're going to do a tour group, you really have to have students and parents who are behind you. Because what can happen is, you know, you plan your tour way in advance because you have to get in touch with the schools. You have to. And our touring philosophy is we don't charge for our tours. It, we feel it's a, there are schools that do, and I understand why, but for us, we feel we're doing a service for the community, but they're also doing a service for us by allowing our students to perform as if they were professionals. So the schools we go to, the libraries we go to, they normally bring in professional actors, and we're a student group. And so that those audiences expect the same level of performance from us. They don't come in, you know, saying, oh, these are kids, so it's not going to be as slick or as professional or as ready. So right. I would I would definitely suggest making sure that when your kids are really committed and that the parents understand the commitment, which really means that very often they have to miss an afternoon of school or a day of school when they're touring. The way I work is we never have extra rehearsals. We might extend an extra half an hour once in a while, but our rehearsals are really one a week. And so that means the students have to be committed to doing the work at home because we can't have extra rehearsals. So they have to be prepared to, you know, I have students who are going on break now, but they've got it planned. They're Skyping once a week to make sure they don't lose their lines because when we come back, we've got four rehearsals left and then they're on tour in February. So that would be the first thing. The second thing would be to make sure that the locations you're going to respect the fact that you're coming in and appreciate the fact that you're coming in, that they're timely, that, you know, they talk to their students about how to behave in the theater, which I think is one of the greatest things that tour can give is not just exposing kids who aren't in a drama program to theater, but exposing kids to how you behave in a theater. You don't bring in your food. It's not time to have a snack. We don't talk to our friends while the show is going on. You know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, as well, you know, to choose material, and it's obviously I'm going to talk about you now, but to choose material. <laughs> oh, it's like a planet. <laughs> yeah. uh, you have to choose material that your audience can relate to. So, for example, this year we're doing Body Body, which you wrote, with our senior girls, uh, senior tour, which happens to be a group of girls. And this was something we sat down. Like I said, very often we do shows for young audiences. So when we've used your shows, for the most part, I'm talking really young audiences, the three to 10 year old group. So when I've used yours, it's usually years where the kids want a new challenge, a different kind of challenge, because we want to do something for a high school audience. And so this particular show, we wanted to do something really unique. So we're actually only performing for audiences of girls. Uh, you, oh, wow. Yeah, we will be doing one show probably, I'm still waiting to confirm this one, at a local library. And that one will be open to anybody. But we're highly suggesting teenage girls and their moms. Or Yeah, and just so people know, Body Body is a play about uh, the main character is a girl and it's about self-image and body awareness. So yeah. uh, what an interesting thing to do to just really not only that the, the play is focused on that, but that the audience is focused exactly. on that. Exactly. And so that for the first time, instead of calling principals and vice principals and whatever, I called the guidance counselors at the schools when I was arranging the show because I wanted to make sure the guidance counselors would be there. They would be prepared to ask questions after just in case there are girls in the audience who are currently going through. I mean, they're all probably going through body issues at the moment, but very serious issues because it does have a bulimic uh, character in the show. And so, you know, the first thing that's going to come to the kids' minds are is anorexia, bulimia, which are huge issues in the schools right now. You know, that's, that's a, a different kind of challenge for us, doing something that serious. In the past, even when we've used your shows in the high schools, they're usually comedies, right? This phone will explode at the phone and, yeah. and wait, wait, we'll bait. You know, those are, those are funny plays, even though they deal with some issues that you could talk about after. This is really issue-based. And I guess 
when I'm giving advice, I would say pick material and then know who you're bringing the material to. Make sure that, you know, this for Body Body, we've made this specific choice that this is a play with young women in it, even though in your casting you want size to be um, the char- that character to be male, we're using a female because this is an all-female show for an all-female audience. I think it really it makes what knowing your your sort of your vision and your your thesis for for what's happening it, it only makes sense that it's yeah, all yeah exactly so it's it's the same thing with picking material I mean last year we used we actually used one of your shows for one of my younger classes which was my grade five to seven group. We use school days, which is hilarious and and so relatable for that age group. And that wasn't a tour show. They just did that for their parents because they, they were younger. That was my 10 to 12 year old students. But what's great about material like that, and again, here's great advice for other drama teachers, is it's an ensemble piece and pretty much everybody's on stage all the time, doing stuff all the time, whether they're speaking or they're not. And that's something that's really a priority for me. It's very, very rare that we choose material in the school, whether it's a tour show or for the younger students that have one lead or two lead roles and then a lot of little roles on the side. We don't do that a lot because I want to challenge each student, one, at the level that they're ready for, but two, I hate the idea of people sitting around waiting. Yes, it's a great experience when you audition for your school play and, you know, you get a smaller role the first year and that role is amazing and it's a great challenge, but you're spending a lot of time backstage. And here, this is a a very unique program that we have very, very small classes. I never have more than 12 students in a class, which means there's never more than 12 in a show. And usually the touring groups are really, really small. There's five students in Body Body. We're doing another show with our juniors this year. Excuse me, uh, that's not one of yours, but for young audiences, that is, there are eight students in that play. Even though there were 14 students in the class at the beginning of the year, I only, you had to sign up to tour to do the second part of the year. You have to be committed to the tour. So there's only eight students in that class. And so I want those eight students to be constantly working and constantly doing stuff. I don't want them to be sitting on the sidelines waiting for their turn. And so I really recommend that to other teachers trying to find as much ensemble work as you can. It doesn't mean it's not a great experience to do those other kinds of shows, but it, it, for us, it's a focus trying to find ensemble work, trying to find pieces that allow everybody to be up there working. And like I said, it doesn't mean that everybody has the same amount of lines. It just means that everybody has a really good challenge on stage. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day and talking to me. And I want to know how this tour goes out. Please keep in touch with uh, how it works with uh, Body Body and particularly what kind of feedback you get from your from your audience. Absolutely. I will. We'll send you a picture. Yes, please. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you so much. Lindsay. Thank you, Aviva. I love how she talks about being in the theater is like being in a in a unit and how much theater helps you to work as a group, to work with other people and to respect the work that each person has to do to make a play happen. I just think that's what I like about theater. I've always loved the ensemble nature of it. It's always been my favorite part. Okay, before we go, let's do some theater folk news. <music> It's a play feature, it's a play feature, it's time to feature a play. What? Not done with new plays yet? Not done with new plays yet. We've got uh, another one to feature, and this one is lovely. I just think it's great. A new Greek myth-inspired work called Ariadne's Thread, The Adventures of Theseus and the Minotaur by Judith White. That's right. We have a Theseus and the Minotaur story, and I just think it it's a little something special. Mostly because uh, Judith takes this great, well-known story and shines a light on it in ways that, that I didn't know, which I love. I love seeing things in a new light. Uh, and particularly the Minotaur here is just, I learned things that I didn't know. Always great, particularly in theater. So she has created a wonderful take two on the Greek chorus. Lots of movement and sound opportunities. And I really like the way that she has used poetry. There's some poetry and some prose, both in the play. But the poetry in the play is really character driven, you know? 
again, I love that. I love when anything is character driven. So, and here's a sample. So Ariadne of Ariadne's Thread, she is King Minos's daughter. And uh, that king, he's the he's the one who's expecting all the, the tributes, if you know the Theseus story, is that uh, there's a minotaur that has to be fed these human tributes. And uh, one year, uh, Theseus decides he's going to go and deal with the minotaur. So Ariadne, who is uh, King Minos's daughter, so she's supposed to be some kind of oracle. And and it's, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. She's sort of a failed oracle because things just aren't working out for her. The same dream over and over. I'm holding the end of a spool of thread, the one Daedalus gave, and tangled up at the other end is this boy I've never seen. What can it mean? I have no clue. How can I be an oracle if I can't even fathom my own dream? Fine priestess I am. When I breathe in the laurel smoke, I don't see visions. I just throw up. My spells at Aphrodite's altar fall flat. The sacred snake curls up and goes to sleep. My dances fail to charm. I can't get a single prayer to rise. I'm stuck. Oh, it's the family bad luck. My duty seems my doom. The tributes will be arriving soon and send them to the fearsome one below. I have never felt so afraid and so alone. <laughs> and awesome. So what a great cross curricular project. It's just a plain old awesome theater project. A great ensemble project. Yes, ensemble. Woo! Go to theaterfolk.com. Read the sample pages for Ariadne's Thread, The Adventures of Theseus and the Minotaur by Judith White. And finally, where oh where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every Wednesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com slash theaterfolk. You can find us on the Stitcher app and you can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search on the word theaterfolk. And that is where we are going to end. <sighs> Ensemble makes me very excited. <laughs> Take care, my friends. Take care. <laughs>